Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We are live on Zoom and now broadcasting on Facebook as well. Um, my name is Edward Simpson, and I'm the director of the SOAS South Asia Institute. We're your host for the afternoon. Uh, I'd like to extend my own warm welcome, and on behalf of my colleagues, Avinash Parawal and Sunil Pung. Uh, SOAS is fortunate to host the WSD Distinguished Honda Lecture. We've done so since 2017. WSD Lecture is funded by the world, an organization called Worldwide Support for Development, which is based in Japan. The first lecture was given by Tony Abbott, the former Prime Minister of Australia, the second by Sir John Key, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, and the third by Professor Thomas Christensen of Columbia University. This year, we're fortunate enough to have Dr. Sasa as our speaker and distinguished guest. He will be known to many of you for his civil society work in Myanmar, and more recently, perhaps, his role as a party campaign manager then country representative to the United Nations, and now Union Minister of International Cooperation, and importantly, spokesperson for the National Unity Government. He describes himself as a reluctant politician, but I think even in his short political career, he's been extremely successful and has worked hard and with tenacity to lobby, to make contacts and to reach out to people and has achieved a lot in an incredibly short amount of time. The lecture today comes at an important time, as you know, in the history of Myanmar. There are important questions about legitimate representation, but also questions about legitimate recognition. There is also a fear of an impending humanitarian crisis and the role of sanctions and international diplomacy in what is happening. So any, any, what Dr. Sasser has to say today is important. And because of the historical juncture, I think will reverberate far beyond the SOAS community and out into the world. The title of his talk is Freedom, Human Rights and Federal, the Federal Democratic Union of Myanmar. And I really warmly welcome you to our virtual SOAS environment. Please, the floor is yours. The talk will be followed by questions and answers. Dr. Sasa, thank you. Dear expected professors, scholars and students, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for having me. Thank you for giving me this opportunity at South Asian Institute, SOAS, the University of London. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to deliver this quiz, the Blue SD Honda lecture. This is the one of the most extensive and inclusive 
scholar committee, communities working on Asian politics and societies, understanding the past. The lecture was delivered by former Prime Minister of Australia, Honorable Tony Abbott, and the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Sir John Kay, and Professor Thomas Christian from Columbia University of New York. And today I am honored that I now have the opportunity to deliver these discourse lectures to you. I'm happy because I'm here to deliver these lectures on behalf of the 54 brave people of Myanmar who have suffered ecstatically for far too long under one of the most cruel, brutal, repressive military dictatorships you know, in the world. These 54 million people of Myanmar whom I represent you today have never received their freedom. Their rightfully belongs to them from birth are being denied. It seems their freedom has been hijacked by this brutal government for the military regime. Their fundamental rights and universal human rights have and are being denied by this oppressive military regime for so long. A federal democratic political system has been the world and the desire of the people of Myanmar since pre-independence era of Myanmar in 1947. In a pre-colonial era before 1824, all the states in Myanmar were living in autonomous states and possess freedom of self-determination. Most of these self-determination, self-administrations allow with each groups and ethnicities respective have their own respective kings and chief and the rights of the people of Myanmar were denied from them for 124 years. In the pre independence year of 1947, the great leaders of the states of Myanmar under the leadership of General Aung came together under the name of Balong Agreements, Balong Conference, where Burma Independent Declaration was agreed to and signed. This was known as the Palong Agreement, which is a political settlement agreement based on federal democratic principles and respect for self-determination and the rights and equality of all the people of Myanmar. But the Palau Agreement was assassinated just, just after it was born. It was gunned down by the military, disposed before it was able to breathe. And where this is true mentalist writing and signing in was that. Therefore, the history of Myanmar provided evidence that these military dictators and their predecessors have stolen power from the people of Myanmar right from inception of our independence in 1948. In 1947, Kalu Uso and his hatchman assassinated General Aung the father of State Councilor Aung San Suu Kyi and the father of Myanmar independence. This act was not merely assassination of General Aung but assassination of the flagship federal democracy and the massacre of Palang Agreement. After General Aung assassinations and assassinations of this Palang Agreement, many ethnic leaders came to realization that their freedom, self-determination were once again stolen away by violence and bloodshed. In 1948, we got our independence from Britain, but without our independent declaration as found in the Palau Agreement, which was based on a federal democratic political system, which enshrined the rights of self-determination, the freedom and human rights and respect 
and equality for all the people in Myanmar. In 1949, right after our independence from Britain, our leaders of most of ethnic groups again began their struggle for freedom and the democracy, which was once again taken away from them by these government of military dictators. Since 1949, ethnic states have engaged the struggle for Fender democracy and their self-determination, which was stolen by assassins and replaced by military dictatorship. The ethnic leader have some independence agreement with General Aosan. Know very well that the military dictatorship would try to wipe them out if they were not able to defend themselves. Dear friends and professors, students, this is the battle that has begun right from our independent, pre-independent. The battle is between military dictatorships and federal democratic political systems. The root cause of the problem again repeated in 1962 under General Newind and his hatchment attack assassinate all aspirations and dream for the federal democratic political system by staging a military coup. And the reign of terror continued to 1988. In 1988, the brave people of Myanmar again stood up to the most brutal military dictatorship, but the movement were brutally oppressed and eventually crushed by homicidal military generals. And their reign of terror continued up to 1990 under the brutal reign of the generals. In 1990, under the repressive reign of General Somong, the military regime control elections was held and NLD wins over 90% of let's life victory. However, humiliated military regime refused to hand over the power to democratically elected government of Myanmar. Rather, they once again sent about destroying the will of the people of Myanmar by oppressing the people, utilizing torture, arbitrary, arrested democratic defenders, and put pro-democracy leader Do Aung San Suu Kyi under house arrest. Systematic and widespread killing and violence follow 1988 revolutions and refusal to accept 1990 elections results give birth to many freedom fighters who have engaged in armed struggles. In 1991, Burma army under the command of General Somong, he sent his government even into my village when I was a very, very young. It was 1991 that I first saw the government in my village. And they came there and they raped the women, they tortured the people, they forced labor the villagers. It was frightening and scary. And they brought all villagers around the regions to force labor under the oppressive regime. Their systematic abuse of human rights, torture, forced labor, rape, intimidation were systematic and widespread. I saw them when I was very young and it was very traumatizing. Since then, my village and other part of Chin State are being occupied till today by the military junta. On another hand, during my childhood, again, I saw my villagers dying without healthcare, die without basic medicines. One day I saw three of my childhood friends die in front of me to diarrhea. One died in the morning, one died in the middle of the day, one died in the evening. That broke my heart. Uh, my mom's best friend went to labor for four or five days and she passed away. And I was thinking to myself, I could be 
the one who died next. I was thinking to my mom could be the next who would die in childbirth. My dad will be next who will be forced labor by the military junta. And my sisters will be the next to be raped by the military junta. And it was real. Dear friends, they have changed my life forever. And I start to think about there must be a better life. There must be a better way to live. There must be a better way where the people of Myanmar live. And I have no idea of how, which, where should I go for education. The school that we have was a bamboo house where the pig, domestic animal all came, we are also there. I still remember my mom gave me the book. The first book I have was the Bible. And there was no picture of elephants or chicken. I came back home, I complained to my mom, why my book does not have any picture. And yeah, my mom do not know how to write and read. She's illiterate. And I was asked my date of birth by the teacher. And I asked my mom, and he said, she said, you are born in the morning when it was raining. And you are born in the year when we have the farm in the mountain. That's where my life began. And my great mom gave me name higher and higher, the Sasa, because she imagines all the troubles and the problem that they are seeing in the village which is getting higher and higher, bigger and bigger. Dear friends, I do not give up. I have the hope if I get educated, I will be able to help my people who are most in need of their help. So it take me in 1995 to go to high school two weeks in Yangon. The bus, the electricity, everything I saw in Yangon was at odd. And as Junker boy, Living in the city was not funny. The hopelessness, the helplessness that came to me was real. I get sexual abuse, physical abuse, and bullied. I don't want to go to that detail. But there was also the year in 1997, when I finished my high school, and all the colleges across the country was again closed down by the military junta because they're afraid of protest by the students. And I came back home to Chin State and rural villages. And I saw the people in my village have no teacher. I became their teacher for two years. That was again the year that changed my life into more deeper. I was continue to see the atrocities of the military junta. Forced labor were continuing, rape, torture, everything was continuing in my part of the world. So one day, student ran to me and he tell me, teacher, one of the students died this morning. When I went to the house where he stayed, it was real. We realized that he was not from my village. As a young teacher, I get all the older students together. We 
transport his body. Two days through the jungle by foot. When we arrive his village, I realized that he was single children, came from single parents. His mom came and said, I don't want to live anymore. I don't have the reason to live. And I was too young to understand at that moment, but I told her, we all are your son. Before you have only one son, now you have God, 70 of boys, us, your son. And I'm Barry, my student, came back and I was thinking to myself, what can I do? Burma side college remained closed. And I hear in the open college, all I can get was chicken and goats. I brought them to the jungle and sold to India villages, chicken and goats. I get some money and get a place to study in India. Finally, I qualified to do medical school in 2002 in the US, UK, like India, studying medicine was too expensive. So I hear about Armenia where I can study cheaper. So I came to Armenia in 2002. I don't have the money to come there. My villagers, again, they gave chicken, cows, and pigs. We saw them. And it came to Armenia. Those contributes just enough for me to buy air ticket. Day one in Armenia, the money over. Finally, I got the support from UK scholarship for the Burma program. And I continued my study in Armenia. And I was lucky and blessed to meet Baroness Cox from UK. She came to know about me through scholarship program. And then she brought me to UK London. And it was the first time, 2004, I arrived in London and then get a lot of clinical replacement in hospitals in the UK. And again, it was 2007 when my people suffer great famines caused by bamboo flower that happened once in every 50 years. So I came back to my people in 2007, and I saw the people, the real people suffer so much for so long. And I add up treating some 500 people a day. It was impossible to do that. And I collect all the evidence of the famines and came back to UK and lobby British government. And finally we secure funding for emergency food aid for more than 120,000 people in the west of Myanmar. 2009, I finished my medical studies and I go back to my people immediately. And I start training a man and woman from each village. And since then, I have trained more than 1,000 men and women from more than 553 villages who are now working for almost half a million people in their regions. And most of my time, so I was spending there and also helping the students in the schools. When after they finish high school, they have no more place to go. And I was able to develop the program to support them. And we have support students who finish high school from those villages to come to India and China and Philippines to study 
and now more than 100 students has qualified for medical schools, engineer colleges, and they have returned to our people. And also I was working in developing the first rural airport in my part of the world. We started projects together with Mission Aviation Fellowship. It became very successful. And also I was leading the project in the sustainable farming programs, replacing slash and burnt agriculture in the regions. And also I led the project that's called traditional birth attendance training. So we trained the women so that the childbirth deaths overcome. And I led the projects in H1 and one crisis that happened in 2007, 2070, sorry. And also this 2020 of COVID-19, we are able to distribute half million N95 face masks across the regions and PPE equipment. And also in 2007, 2015, when there was a cyclone Nakis, I was evolved and heavily in that project, we were able to deliver 100,000 tons of foods and medical aid to the people. And here we come, 2020. I was approached by our leaders in the country to be part of political campaign manager. And then I campaigned for NLD in the last elections. And I campaigned for unity, campaigned for human rights, campaigned for freedom, campaigned for federal democracy. And my message was heard across the country and they vote for us and the people of Myanmar spoke clear and loud on 8th of November, 1920. And we go on last line of victory. In Chin State where I came from, 93% of the voters vote for us. And I was there in Nebido when 1st of February military coup took place. I was about to take senior role at the government. It was the 1st of February in the morning that we are supposed to form and sweat in front of the nations to lead the country. In coming government 2021 and 2026. But what we saw was a government with the smoky guns to kill us and the rest of us torture us. So I was told to flee this as possible so that I became the face and the voice of the people. And it took me three days and three nights to escape from there with a great risk. Since then I became Myanmar Special Envoy to United Nations. And now I'm serving at National Energy Government of Myanmar as International Cooperation Minister and Spokesperson for National Unity Government. Dear friends, what we have been seeing in Myanmar is the struggle between justice and injustice. It is the battle between freedom and the battle between military dictatorship. I just like to again repeat that these military generals dictatorship that we have seen is not new. The same have happened in 1947. The same thing happened in 1962. The same thing happened in 1988 and 1997, 2007, 2017, when they slaughter our Rohingya brothers and sisters and the world watch 
the horror of atrocities and the crime against humanity. This is the clear denial of human rights and the freedom for the people of Myanmar. They want to establish military dictatorship as the country political system where the people of Myanmar have spoken clear and loud that they want to establish federal political system, federal democratic political system as the country political system. Since 1st of February, these military generals and their governments under the control of General Ming Aulai, they have killed nearly 800 and 900 civilians, including 72 children. Nearly 6,000, including our Sasuji, our state councillor, and President Uwimin has been arrested without cost, without reasons. And more than 1,800 people are being into arrest warrants. I have been charged with the high treasons against the country by these military generals who is committing high treason against the people of Myanmar every day. And again, more than 1 million people are being displaced by this violence. The violence we have been seeing are both systematic and widespread. United Nations Development Program have said that there are half populations of the country, 54 million, which means 27 million, will be living under the poverty line within a year. Again, World Food Program has come up and said 6.4 million people of Myanmar will be without food by the end of October 2021 this year. These brutality and atrocities instigated by these military generals that we have been seeing are real. And as nationality government that we have formed in the first time in our history, we are asking international community to come and recognize as soon as possible, recognize the world and the desire of the people of Myanmar that has been spoken clearly. And here I just like to read what we are asking international community to come together and stand solidarity with the people of Myanmar. We are asking international community and the government around the world to stand with the people of Myanmar by engaging and recognizing and supporting national unity government. That is the first time in our history that our country come united together and form this national unity government of Myanmar. Again, we are asking that the international community will not just only engage with us, but also will please support us with humanitarian needs. As I stated, the humanitarian great catastrophe has been created by this military junta. And we are asking international community and around the world to come together to impose both diplomatic and financial suction against these military generals because they are buying a lot of weapons from stolen the world of the people of Myanmar from gas, from oil, from timber, from precious stones. And they bought those weapons from China and Russia and they killed the people of Myanmar. 
it is unacceptable. We are asking all international around the world to come together with tougher sanctions, targeted sanctions, and coordinated sanction against this military junta. And we have laid out a clear roadmap to defeat these military dictatorships. Number one, we have laid out the clear roadmap defeating and eradicating of military dictatorships and reform and replace military institution as a whole with the military armed forces that will be under the control of civilian government. And the second, we have abolished and determined to complete nullifications of 2008 constitutions, which was drafted and created by military generals for military generals, and repeal and replace the constitution and the law such as 1982 citizen law, which is discriminatory law against the people of Myanmar, particularly the minority, and replace them with permanent constitution of Myanmar that based on Fendre democratic principles. And the, thought that the, the third, we have laid out a clear roadmap to build Fendre Democratic Union of Myanmar, under which freedom, human rights for all the people of Myanmar, regardless of race, regardless of culture, regardless of gender and ethnicities, the rights will be protected, respected and promoted. And the Fendre Union where the three branches of the government, executive, parliamentarians, judiciary will operate independently and where the power sharing and resource sharing based on the principle of Fendre democratic and self-determination will take place. And we have got determinations to achieve that no matter what. Again, dear friends, the people of Myanmar are in a dire state of crisis. Crisis entirely made by this terrorist military junta. I hope that this G7 members take the opportunity to stress to international community that the state of affairs of Myanmar will not be normalized, will not be legitimized, but rather will be persuaded and punished. For there is nothing normal about taking power by a barrier of a gun, nothing normal about the prospect of half of us being a poverty line in less than a year, nothing's normal about taking people you were swear to protect from their homes in the middle of the night to torture them to death. Nothing's normal about the mandatory of nearly 900 civilians in Austin. There's nothing normal about killing its own people, its own children. There's nothing normal about declaring war against its own people by using heaven battlefield weapons. I'm very proud of courageous people of Myanmar who are on the front lines of this movement to liberate our nation from the brutal military regime. For their bravery, their commitment of freedom to freedom, human rights and federal democracy and justice for all the people of Myanmar. Ladies and gentlemen, mark my words. With the opposition to this illegal junta, we will win in our struggle to liberate Myanmar from the brutal military junta. One, on the end of this fight, we will emerge as united Myanmar that is committed to freedom, defender democracy, human rights for all, and to being a responsible partner in the global community. This is a terrible crisis, but there is also, this is also opportunity 
that happened was in a century. This is the opportunity to defeat this reign of terror and deliver freedom and justice to the brave people of Myanmar who have suffered so much for so long. In the last 72 years of pain and suffering must come to an end. We must seize this opportunity to replace military dictatorship once for all with federal democratic Myanmar where human rights, freedom, justice, will be served and protected and respected for all people of Myanmar, regardless of race, culture and gender, ethnicity and religious. Freedom of Myanmar. Human rights for all people of Myanmar and federal democratic union for all people of Myanmar is the only way to everlasting peace in Myanmar. It's the only way to end this century of great pain and suffering. This is the only way to everlasting stability and prosperity for all the people of Myanmar, and its neighbor regions and for the world. We will never surrender, we will never give up. We will not rest until freedom, justice, human rights and federal democracy is achieved for all the people of Myanmar. Justice will prevail, freedom will prevail, human rights will prevail, Federal democracy will prevail. Thank you all once again from the bottom of my heart. May God bless you all. I'd like to go more into discussion and questions. Once again, thank you very much indeed for having me today. And having said that, I'll be posting all of this in my lecture today into social media and my Facebook. And maybe I'll give this to SOAS so that you can post in uh, into uh, social media, your page so that, uh, uh, you know, after this, you can read. So once again, thank you very much for having me. Dr. Sasa, thank you very much. When we're live on the internet, there is no applause function as there would be in a normal lecture theater. You have to imagine the applause, I'm afraid, for that important personal and, and really rather moving lecture. Thank you very much on behalf of the SIAS South Asia Institute. I think the story shows very clearly about the, the role of and power of education and primary health care in social transformation and in, in your own life. The story of the struggle between justice and injustice is a story for our times. And I thank you for sharing it with us in such an eloquent and, and moving way. There are a number of questions have appeared in the chat, um, but I'd like to start off by asking you um, about sanctions. As you, as you will know, the governments of the UK, US and elsewhere have announced targeted sanctions, uh, and you referred to demand to extend them. And for those of us who might be interested in writing to our MPs, or lobbying in some way for an extension of those sanctions. I wonder if you could be more specific what you had in mind and what sort of sanctions um, the international community could think of imposing without further damaging ordinary people in Myanmar as well. That the people of Myanmar have sanctioned themselves in, in a very, very difficult way. They refused to work under military junta. That means they joined the strike and the boycott. That means they don't get the salary, they don't get the pay. They know that they have no future with this military junta anymore. And they also know that this hardship that they are facing by refusing to work under the military junta is temporary. So what we are seeing right now is the revenue, the tax coming from international company working in the country from gas, oil, industry, 
and state-owned business, and they are paying those tax to the, directly to the military junta's pocket. So we see every year, every month, this Ming Aulai and his brutal regime are receiving at least from few company, I can tell you from total Chafron, Pasco, PPTP, is four company still paying some hundreds millions of dollars every month. So what about the other company? They are working in Myanmar, pay a lot of money. That belongs to the people of Myanmar. Gas belongs to the people of Myanmar. Why belongs to the people of Myanmar? So it should not be allowed to go to the military junta that killed the people of Myanmar. So that means that those money and tax and everything that's to do with um, the tax paying, it has to be reversed by their home countries. Maybe they hold those money a few months in their home countries by their own home government. And then when the Myanmar returns to democracy, maybe those money has to be released so that it can be used for the people of Myanmar. It can be used for health, education, and food security, for development. Right now, all the money they are paying goes directly to the military junta, the generals, and more money they get from international company as a tax, and they buy weapons from China and Russia and other country, and they kill more people. So what we are saying is that in some situation, it, 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 may, uh, it may bring some hardship for temporary, but hardship is better than death or killing. So what I'm saying is that all the pressure available, public pressure or government pressure or the money that is from the public or the private or the government, all has to be stopped flowing to the military junta. So all country around the world must stop giving more money to this military junta. And that's very simple because the more they give the money, more people will be killed. Thank you for that very clear answer. Okay, so for those of you who are joining us uh, via Facebook, if you have questions for Dr. Sasser, please write them on the Facebook page and they will be relayed to us. We have a number of questions already in our Zoom space, which I'm now going to go through. The first is from Rajiv Bhattacharya, who I understand is a journalist um, in India, who asks in a very straightforward way, what is your expectation from India? India is the father of, the founder of non-violence movement. And it's the largest uh, democracy in the world. We look to India in many ways. And India people are democratic and free people. And Myanmar, be Myanmar become democracy country is a good for India in many, many ways. And then there's a lot of leverage that India have right now in humanitarian, opening the border for humanitarian relief because the people of Myanmar, as I say right now, they are in a crisis. As I said, there's 6.4 million people will be without food by the end of no October, according to the World Food Program. And again, there will be 27 million out of 54 million people living under the poverty line within a year. 
And as the violence continue, all this is going to cause a huge burdens to our neighbor. So stability in Myanmar will be stability in India. And the peace in Myanmar will bring also peace to India in many ways. And we will become a great alliance for India when we became democratic country. And then that is to a win-win to all sides, but we need to help from India. India needs to help us in these moments of the darkest in our history. Particularly, we look to India as the, in the UN international, uh, they have got the great airlines like, uh, you know, uh, democracy worlds and the free world, with United States and the European Union and many other country, like Japan and South Korea, which are all democratic country. And I believe that is, uh, you know, if there is uh, India bringing a coalitions on Myanmar through its democratic value, that will be inspirational to Myanmar. And that this flame of democracy and the freedom and human rights has to come from India to Myanmar across the border. So there's a lot that we can cooperate together. There's a lot that we can do together. And we again appreciate greatly to India. Uh, I know they have done so many, many things already, but uh, we need more help. We need more engagements. And I, I believe that uh, India government will recognize national unity government as the sole a democratic government of Myanmar elected by the people of Myanmar. So such kind of recognitions and engagements and the cooperations with national unity government is a very, very important. Okay, thank you very much. For those of you who are asking questions, could I ask um, that you just give me a few words in your question about who you are? Uh, that'll help, I think, to contextualize the question. So the next, the next question is from somebody called San Sam Mia, who thanks you for the speech and for representing the people of Myanmar, um, points out that the, the other side is heavily armed, but asks a very interesting question. One day for the sake of peace and tranquility for our country and people, would you consider negotiating with those who led the coup? Again, we there's three things. Number one, doing nothing, which is not going to happen. Number two is political solutions by political means. Number three is we like it or not, the only option left is military actions. That is violence. So we always believe that uh, political problem has to be solved by political means. So political situations, political problem, particularly in 21st century, cannot be solved in the battlefield it's always solved in a table, dialogue, talk. But sometimes political solutions to come to the table, this needs to be the pressure. So like in Myanmar, what's happening now is this side, the military junta, they went to build military dictatorship as the country political system so that they can continue their reign on terror and this nightmare will continue. That's why what I'm saying is that the, the root cause of the problem in Myanmar is this military dictatorship and that side is Fender political system, their promise for freedom and human rights. 
This side is dictatorship. This side is democracy. So when they come into politics, what I'm saying is that we need all this pressure. When we say like uh, sanctions, you know, international communities should come together, say to mean our life, enough is enough. You cannot solve the political problem by violence. We are not going to give you any more money, number one, no more weapons, number two, unless you come and stop killing the people, your own people, and come to the table to talk about politics. So for us, the dialogue to happen, we need Ming Aulai and military junta. Stop the killing. It's a very simple. They have to stop the killing. Number two, release all political prisoners of Sasuchi president. We mean all release unconditional. He keep them hostage. And that's why I will come and talk to you. It's not going to work. So we also completely understand and has to understand that these military junta, they have got billions of billions of bullets. This is only one, uh, there's only 53 million people, but they have got 50, not just 53, they have got maybe 100 billions of bullets. That's why we are saying to international community, the bloodbath is coming. If you do not take any actions, great civil war is coming. If you do not take any actions against this military junta, and that will be any genocide. Why? Because they bore those weapons to oppress the people of Myanmar. We have no war with our neighbor. We have no enemy outside of our country. They suddenly declare the people of Myanmar as their enemy. It's like cancer within your body. It's like cancer. This military dictatorship is like cancer in Myanmar. So it's a very important for us to understand that. So um, the only way to dialogue is to give more and more pressure to this military junta until they stop and think again that they will never be able to solve political problem by killing their own people. It's not going to happen. And the people of Myanmar say, do or die. We don't like to live under military junta anymore. Enough is enough. So 54 million people of Myanmar say enough is enough. So there's no any other choice. Really, it's no choice. Then for them to surrender to violence and come to negotiation table and release all political prisoners and withdraw all these men, gunmen that they have discharged with better few weapons, the neighborhoods across the village, across the city, across the towns in the country. So if they withdraw all of those forces and stop killing the people and release political prisoners, yes, it's a chance of solving this crisis in the table, not with the bullets, not with the bombardment, not with the fighter jets, it's with people on the table. We have to compromise on the table. Thank you. The next question is from um, Justin Watkins, who is a colleague of mine at SOAS. He's a professor of Burmese. And he asks, Dr. Sasa, thank you for your compelling upsetting and inspiring account of the violent history of Myanmar 
in your courageous struggle to bring peace. The events in Burma this year have shocked the world and it's not clear what the future holds. He wants to ask you, uh, a native of Matupi, about your view of the role that ethnic and linguistic diversity may play in bringing about a vision of a federal and democratic nation. So it's a question really about your views of the roles of ethnic and linguistic diversity in the making of a new Myanmar. Let us not forget that the greatest strength of Myanmar is our unity in diversity. In a way, our national strength is on our diversity. It's powerful, it's very powerful. In the way it's beautiful. That's why when we say Fendere democracy, that means that all those languages will be protected. All those race will be protected. All those culture will be protected. Not just protected, it will be promoted and respected. That's very important. It's very important. And with the self determinations, because Fendre means self determinations. So it's like flower gardens. Myanmar is like a big flower garden where there's so many types of flower bloom together in a garden. The chains are flowers, the karims are flower, the shans are flower, moons are flower, rakhines are flower, bamans are flower. It's very beautiful there. This is the beauty there. Rohingya and brothers and sisters are flowers. Yeah. And our common ground is our rights to live. Our common ground is our freedom. Our common ground is equality. Our common ground is every right, freedom. We'll be protected. Every culture, every language, every race, every religious, every ethnicity will be protected, respected, and promoted with self determinations. That is our future. That is the beauty. That is the beauty. So what I'm saying is that it is the military junta that has used divide and rule policy for many, many years. Divide, rule, and conquer. Let's not forget. Divide, rule, and conquer. They divide us based on race. They divide us based on religious. They divide us based on ethnicities. They divide us based on culture. Remember, those days are over. Those days are over. We will never allow ourselves again to be divided by these people, never again. We should all say never again to these people, never again. Yeah, there is no future of Myanmar as long as there is racism. There is no future of Myanmar as long as there is this military dictatorship continuously dividing us based on our race, our ethnicities, our background, our culture, our religions. Yeah. So Myanmar is a multi-ethnic country. Myanmar is a multi-religious country, multi-cultural country. It's like multi-flowers garden. It's a big garden. Myanmar is a big garden of flowers. You know, we all are flowers with respect, respecting each other, protecting each other, caring for each other. So the future uh, is beautiful. Once we defeat it, that's why we have got the real map. One is to defeat 
eradicate this cancer of military dictatorship and build and draft permanent constitution of Myanmar and build Federal Democratic Union of Myanmar so that all this blue flower can be bloom again. So let us remember again that our nation's strength is our unity in diversity. That's why when I get a presentation just now, it's the first time in the history of Myanmar that we have a national unity government. Our government, its name is unity. Why? That is the center of our country. That is the strength of our country. So this is the greatest chance that we have to defeat. United, we defeat this military junta. And that is very important for us. And this opportunity happened once in a century that I can tell you, this is the first time I saw in the history of our country that our people are so much united together. That side is a military dictatorship, military generals, and this has 54 million people of Myanmar united. Maybe the platform we're standing may not be the same, but I can tell you, we are so united. They give me the hope, the strength that we will defeat these darknesses soon. Thank you very much. I'm going to move now to doing two, two questions together. So questions will come in pairs. So we manage to get through what we have. There's a question from uh, Julimo Colombo, who is a consultant who works with international NGOs, who asks two questions. So actually, you'll have three questions in this round, two questions. The first is, do you start to envisage a time when um, to engage with China and to think about the role of international NGOs who are caught in a space between dictatorial, dictatorial and territorial power and freedom and whether international NGOs um, could play a different role in the situation given, I think the question is, given that they have a different sort of structure that is not national in its context. So that's the first two questions. And then from Miao Ning Ang, it's, uh, may I request your view of the public situation, public health situation, sorry, in Myanmar, and how international cooperation could be used to improve the public health situation, because, worried about the provision and accessibility of health care and many health professionals have died and arrested and i suppose importantly it's easy to forget that this question comes in an era of covid as well it's not just a coup it's an era of covid and miao nian ang is associate professor of global health uh, in tokyo japan so please dr sasa China is a very important neighbor and a very big neighbor. Um, as long as there's Myanmar, there will be China. That is, that is very important. Uh, and again, China has the power to stop this military junta. And if they want to, they can stop it today. One phone call from Beijing can stop it, I can tell you. But again, um, China want to see Myanmar stable, economically stable and open for economy. They have got a great project called One Bell, One Road that has to come through Myanmar. They have got a lot of the projects. There's uh, more than 400 Chinese projects in Myanmar. And uh, there's more than 23 billion investments in the country from China. So there's a huge interest. That's why we are saying 
the, the stability to the stability uh, the way to stability is a peace the only way to stability is a peace the only way to stability is a federal democratic system of political system as long as there is this dictate military dictatorship system in the country what we can be very clear is there will be never peace in Myanmar. Myanmar will never stable again as long as there is these mandras in the country. So in the way, if I describe as medical doctor, our country has a cancer. I have a cancer. I cannot be stable because I have cancer. The only way to heal the country is to replace that cancer, like cancer, military dictatorship with federal democratic political system. So we have made it that clear to international community and to China and particularly to all our neighbors. When we get stability, Myanmar will become stable when the rights are being respected and when the freedom are being respected and promoted. In another hand, we'll never get stable as long as there's oppression, as long as there's a repressive regime. Once we get into that peace, once we get into that federal democratic union, what I can tell you is that Let's say now China investment is just 23 million billion dollar. That time I can tell you the, it will boom into maybe 50 million dollar, uh, you know, maybe 100 billion dollar because our economy. That's how we have got big country India. That's how we have got big country China. And Myanmar is geopolitically, economically, it can be the hub between this great economic power in the region as well, in the world. So it's good for India, it's good for China, it's good for everyone. That's why we are asking that, you know, democracy is something that will stabilize the country. In other words, only democracy can stabilize Myanmar. No others, no weapons, no the bomber, no the bullets. We have made it clear that is for China to accept and then other neighbors to accept that fact, that true. Um, the second question about the health care and is, is a great concern. Is COVID-19 coming up in the region? There's a third wave coming up. And what's happened in India that we have seen is, great tragedy We're really sorry for what has happening with COVID-19 in India and we do really pray every day every moment that this you know this this will go away sooner it started to happen in Myanmar and these military dictators military junta number one they kick out all the doctors, the nurses from hospitals, and they they live in the hospital, they occupy the hospital. Just imagine, for what? And they fire all the, uh, the nurses, the midwife, who work life-saving work because of the joint strike or civil disobedient movement. And let me make it clear. This is civil disobedient movement is the most powerful movement, more powerful than this military junta act of terrorism. And even now, this Nobel Peace Prize, Norway Oslo University professor have nominated them Nobel Peace Prize. They deserve not only Nobel Peace, they deserve the support of international community. 
So instead of military junta say, look, if they are the strike, they have to come and talk to them. Yeah. What can I do? Because you don't like to come work on us and what's wrong. And they know that. So what I'm saying is military generals, they cannot even deliver COVID-19 vaccination. The generous people of Myanmar has contributed the money for COVID-19 vaccination. We have every reason to believe that military junta have used those money and buy weapons and kill the people. You know, forget about COVID-19 vaccination. They don't care, they don't care. So they failed to form the government. Any government around the world, if the same government, they are responsible to deliver healthcare. The governments are responsible to deliver education. The governments are responsible to deliver all these, these things in, in, in the country of any nation in the world. But imagine this military junta. Do they take any responsibility for COVID-19? No, so whatever, no. Do they take any responsibility for education? No. From day one of um, 1st of February till today, 9th of June, in these four months, all they are doing is killing, killing, and killing. Torture, torture, torture. So our healthcare has failed. Education has failed. Economic has failed. Let us remember, Myanmar is becoming a failed state very quickly under a failed coup. Fell state and the fell coup. The final one about international organizations. Humanitarian needs are great. And all the government that we have been talking and I have been engaging internationally, it's my job to engage and cooperate with international community and the government around the world. It just, it's just very difficult. Um, I mean, they are targeting all NGO and INGO in the country. Basically say, don't work anymore. Because they are used, they are trying to use humanitarian aid, which should be neutral, not political. But they are using it, they want to use as political. So whichever will allow them to do that, they will be allowed to work. But whoever do not, they will cut point and they say, leave this place. So they, they do not have any respect for humanitarian law. These are the people, let's remember, let's not forget that. These are military generals who even break the law that they make 2008 constitution was created by them, right? In 2008 constitution, sitting president cannot be arrested. There's no any chapter that say that sitting president can be arrested, but he arrested Mr. President, who we mean elected. So he break 2008 constitution that he made. So these military generals, let us remember and not forget that they do not even respect the law that they made. They break the law that they make. There is no law that says military generals of Ming or Lai can take a power like that. There's no, there's no law. But he is using the law that he does not have. So what I'm saying is that they have no respect for human life. They are not. They are not having human human thinking. They are not human being. I think they are not having human, um, uh, you know. Como, so I don't know how to describe this. It's just beyond of what I can describe of who they are now. Dr. Sasa, thank you very much. Now, 
I must apologize to lots of people who have asked questions that we're not going to have time to address. Um, many scholars and commentators have written in with quite detailed questions, but there's one question um, which will be your final, final one from an anonymous attendee that in some ways I think gets to the spirit of many of the other questions that have been asked. And that is really simply, Dr. Sasa, will we win this fight? First of all, we are already winning. This is a fair coup. They failed to do anything of what the government would do. So they are already failing. They already failed coup. They attempted, but they failed. So let us be clear. This 20, 24 ministry, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Transport, so name it. There's 27, 24 ministry. But Ming Aulai fell to all of 22 ministry. He do not think about that. He do not think, absolutely nothing. He failed to do it. Example is healthcare. Example is education. He failed to do it. Okay. Now, Number uh, two ministry, only that is somehow he controlled by gun, our Ministry of Home Affairs and Minister of Defense. I can give you so many of his soldiers, at least in our list, more than 800 military officers have run away from him. More than 800 military have run away from him. He understand that. In the coming days, I can I, I, I hope and I pray that these military uh, men and women in uniform, we will find a way for them so that they can defect from the, the, this man. These are bad people. And many men and women in uniform, they don't like to be with them anymore. They don't like to be slave under Ming Outlaw anymore. It's very sick. But we are now developing a strategy. How can that happen peacefully? Because we don't like them die. Yeah. So he's saying, kill or be killed. If you do not kill them, I'll kill you. That's Ming of lies. That's the junta words. So again, why we will win is they fell. <laughs> That's why we will win, <laughs> number one. Let's be clear. <laughs> He failed it. That's why we win it. Number two, he know his days are in number. Till today, there's no even one country that recognize this military junta as the government of Myanmar. Not even one country in the world. Not even China, I can tell you. They don't recognize it. That's why we win. Third point, the people of Myanmar reject him completely, totally. 54 million people say no to him already. That's why we will win and we already win. So given that, now we are winning international front. US, European Union, UK, and other country are coming with us and putting more and more sanctions. And it will come, I can tell you, only tougher and tougher. The sanctions will come more and more tougher and tougher until he gave up. That's why we will win. And now we have stopped some of his money income. We have cut off, cut off. So we will have less access to money and less access to weapons. That's why we will win. Number five point. Now we are united. Ethnic arms organizations, political party, elected member of parliament, civil society organizations, politicians, we all are united against him. That's why we win. So 
There's a lot of reason I can go on why we win. But I cannot see any reason why he will win. I don't see any reason why military coup will win. I do not see any reason. But I see a lot of reason why we will win. So I describe already that. So we will win. And Ajaydopo Aoyami, we already win. It's no more Ajaydopo Aoyami. It is Ajaydopo Aonebi. So Ajaydopo Aoyami, ma Ajaydopo Aonebi. So what I'm saying is, we revolution must win was the, the slogan we used to say. But now, revolution is winning. We are set to victory. So we are going to win and we are going to prevail. Because if you look at the whole history, democracy will prevail, freedom will prevail, justice will prevail and human rights will prevail. We like it or not, the light will prevail over the darkness. The, the, the good things will prevail over the bad, the bad things. The right things will prevail on the wrong things. And that side, again, uh, you know, the, the, the truth will prevail on the false. The same, it's very the same. Justice will prevail over injustice. Fairness will prevail over unfairness. It's very simple. So we are winning. Dr. Sasa, thank you very much. Uh, it just leaves me to thank you um, for giving a, a moving, passionate, personal, persuasive, engaging lecture and, and taking on the questions at, at face value. Uh, and answering them with so much passion. So on behalf of the South Asia Institute at SOAS and WSD Hunda, uh, I'd like to thank you for delivering this distinguished lecture. Your, your time and thoughts are much appreciated. And I would like my last message to go to our audience, the guests who've come to listen to you speak. And I'd ask you um, to take away the experience of listening to Dr. Sasser and talk to your friends, family, share the experience on Facebook, let them make up their own minds about what has been said, but do talk. Turn this inspirational experience into something that generates more conversation. Perhaps a conversation that leads to lobbying, a letter to an MP, whatever it might be, but please don't leave here and think about this issue no more. So thank you very much. Thank you for spending your time with us on this afternoon. And finally, once again, on behalf of SOAS, Dr. Sasser, really thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to engage with you throughout this process and your lecture was a, a fitting one for this series. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for having me. Yedopo Aoyami.